Welcome to the Mirror Talks podcast, where we deconstruct some of humanity's most disconnecting and limiting assumptions and offer an alternative, a free state of consciousness, unbiased, naturally wise, and genuinely loving. We will shed a more enlightened perspective on everyday experiences to help anyone willing realize their true potential and inspire a contemporary spiritual life lift in service to all. Say goodbye to the man-made paradigms of distorted ideas. Let's become pure, free, and actually intelligent once again. Hey everyone, welcome to the last episode of season one of the Mirror Talks podcast with Bentinho Massaro. I'll introduce this one briefly because it's the continuation of the conversation we had with our good friend Anurag Gupta. So to hear the full conversation, I recommend starting with part one before continuing on with this one. This second part of the conversation dives deep into the topics of being sourceful, purifying your desires, and not getting sidetracked by the fruits of your labor. So have fun, enjoy, and thanks for being with us for the first season of Mirror Talks. So what do you guys both think is the, the most important thing for people to focus their energy on? Well, um, for me, it's fairly clear. And then even if people have a question after that myth of performance conversation, well, if not growth, then what, you know? Because sometimes people after that, like, don't even know. And I, I'm, it's really clear for me. And I'm going to go through the stages in which it's involved because I think they're really important. So, um, you know, I was all, for many, for a couple of decades, I've been really committed to, I, want, I just love people being joyful and fulfilling their lives. You know, like I just love that. And I, so I want to help people do that. So I would go to people and say, what, what would make you happy, right? And they would say, a very common thing would be, I want to grow my business, right? I would help somebody triple their business. And then at the end, they're not only not more happy, they're actually less sometimes stressed by this and that. And I'm like, Jesus, this is off, right? So then I went through many steps, but I'll jump to a couple of key milestones. Then I went to, okay, before I help people achieve what they want, I have to get them connected to a sourceful wants. I created exercises about having cleansing their wants list, for instance. It was a very good exercise. People, we would get like 80% of their wants are what I would call false wants. Like when you, you want it, you think you'll be happy when you get it, you get it, and you're not any happier. You know, you're happy for a day and then it's gone, right? So then I got good at having people get to a much more grounded and aligned space, create what they wanted, and then get that. And then it was better, but there was still something pretty significant missing. So then I, um, again, went through some other steps. It got better and better, but still something missing. Then I got, oh, I thought then I thought I had a brilliant moment. Um, it never is, but... <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> in the scale of things yeah, the scale, yeah. That, that it was like uh, okay they only want these things in order to have an experience in life so might as well jump into that experience because I can do that I can if you say well I want to experience this and this I can, I can start to create oh you don't have to go and do these things and experience that later here's how to experience that now whether you want joy or connectedness or you know whatever and so then I started to work with people let's work towards having that experience in life and that got even quote better but there was still not whole. There were still this different things and fears. There was still something missing. So I went further and further than that, and it just didn't land. Sorry, didn't, let me say it differently. Still, still something missing. Let me just say it like that, right? Mm -hmm. So then the point where it all turned is, uh, and then it changes everything, and it's counterintuitive. So the point of navigation, so first of all, for instance, I realized that the pursuit of an experience is no different than the pursuit of the material. Like a teacher once said, uh, the attachment to things spiritual is no different than the attachment to things uh, uh, material. It's still an attachment. So it was like, oh, it's still the same thing. I really thought that, I really, I really thought for a moment, ah, oh, I'm really, and I'm going straight to experience and that's juice and it's not about material and it's still an attachment. So, the thing was, what I had become very reliable in, in the world, is you could set any goal, any outcome in front, and I would exceed it. You could say it's a, a, a 
physical thing. You could say it's a relationship thing, but I could transform shit. I could like help people achieve and exceed whatever it was. It still didn't matter. But the point of navigation is here's where I want to get. That like here's the navigation point of navigation is here's what I'm getting to, which of course seems like a logical point of navigation, right? Mm -hmm. But then when everything flipped, when I hit the end of that and it was still bankrupt, I got something. I, I spent a lot of time, and finally, what arose was is the point of navigation is where am I coming from? Hmm. Not where am I getting to, but where am I coming from? And that, man, I, I don't even have words to describe. When people drop into there, first of all. There's no temporality to it. If you start altering where you're coming from, it is now. There really is no place to get. It requires a kind of an integrity, kind of a courage at the beginning until and that actually starts to disappear till it's just who you are. But the thing is, Corey, it's about where are you coming from? Now, here's the things. When, I, you, when here's where you're getting to, I could promise we could get there, but I couldn't promise what your experience of life would be. This is the opposite. If you really stay true, first of all, it's about getting trued up to who you are, what the source of your life is, what you're calling, whatever you want to call it, but really truing up to yourself and staying true to that, no compromise, no lack of honor. Similar to what I call the seeking impulse, like that lifeline to the creator. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, so then if you, if you never, if you stay true to that and really stay true to where I'm coming from when I make this step and this step and this decision, this choice, and you stay true, mm -hmm. I can promise you two things, the reverse of before. I can promise you for sure, absolutely for sure, you have no idea where you're going to end up. <laughs> I don't mean maybe, but like no question. Awesome. You have no idea where you're going to end up. <laughs> That's cool. And number two, but wherever you end up, you will be at home. Yeah, you start at the goal. You will, the you, you, you are, because right now you are doing, you're making choices that have integrity, have honor, and you've just, it just gives you life. I walked away from thing. I said no to contracts of millions of dollars and that because they lacked integrity and they gave me so much cool. me. I was talking to Fernando a couple of years ago. I was telling Dennis about how I realized that these millions of dollars I walked away from, every time I said no to that, which I, I, it, it gave me myself. And if I had that money now, I couldn't buy the pizza that I have in my state of being. You know, I just, there's no way. And um, so there's a different world and people have to trust something, everything different than they've been programmed or taught to or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So in that part, that part takes courage at the beginning. Right. But once you do it for a bit, you go, this yep. is so good, I'm never going back. And then the, as Ben says, the courage starts to not be required anymore. But yeah. even that, when I tune into some of my friends, people who haven't done any work like this, the idea of, of staying true to what they are is already elusive. Like, like you've had a few modalities that have guided people into that, but like, what about somebody without any modality? Like, what's the simplest way to have people get oriented to that? Well, they have to be first aware of it as a choice. The, we have to understand that the idea of that doesn't really exist in the common dialogue right right so first people have to distinguish it as a possible choice and then mm -hmm. then there's um so the foundation of that work of making the transition from my perspective is trust of self so um i've discovered i've been working hard to have it find a way to make it available to like anybody not people who are doing a lot of this work and the, one of the most fundamental things that I've come across is, is that people actually get, some of you have seen me when I do the worst case scenario exercise, like, okay, well, what if you stayed true in this, you know, this, and you lost your job and this, and you, oh, you ended up on your mom's couch, whatever. If you really do the work, I say, okay, worst case happened. Okay. What are the next 20 actions you would take? Right. And write them down. You know, people go, I'm get back on my feet. No action. Oh, I would call these friends. I would get in the internet, start looking for work. If people really do the exercise and start to see the actions they would take, I said, okay, imagine that happened 60 days ago. Now, what would you be doing? And they, they, everybody realizes they would take actions, get back on their feet. <laughs> then I say, okay, where will you be a year or two from now? If you really do the work, you'll discover that a year or two from now, your life will be better than it is now because you'll have gotten rid of everything that's not aligned. When you've got nothing, you make m better steps moving forward that are better for you. You keep a bunch of stuff that's not right for you because you're just there, right? So, um, and then, uh, so the worst case scenario of losing everything for almost everybody is your life gets better. <laughs> 
So I have them get that. I really work with having people get that now so they can- To cultivate the trust, right? Yes. The, the main thing is, sure, yes, that's the most important point is that you have can trust yourself mm-hmm. to get back on your feet, to do what you need to do. And people have lost that trust yourself. They're mm-hmm. embroiled in a world of fear. And people operate, and I'm not kidding about this because I've done this with like literally billionaires, they operate like their life is threatened when only their lifestyle is threatened. And for me, that's one of the most pivotal things. And when you actually get, and by the way, don't take my word for it, you can study thousands of people who lost everything and then got back and they go, that's one of the best things that ever happened. If I had my way, people would lose everything once a year. And then the next year they'd create a life from scratch again in a different direction. And in 50 years, they'd felt like they lived 50 lifetimes. Because in one of the most important things that happens, you know that people live, I include myself until I went in a few directions, that in, the, in, in a kind of background state of fear. The fear of what? Of losing everything, what happened? This, and then if you lose everything, and then you get back on your feet, the best gift is that that fear is gone because you know you can fall down on your skis and get back up again. Do you know what I'm saying? That's so juicy. But it's the trust of self. It's the trust hmm. of self. People have disconnected, in my experience, of knowing that they can do what needs to be done. So they don't go for it. They don't say true. They don't say no to what doesn't, what's not aligned. They don't say no to what's true. Cause, but actually, they could say no to all of that. And they, ha- on one hand, we go, oh, people are this and they're amazing and they're powerful. Then we go, oh, no, they're small and they can't. No, you know, like, it, of course, no, people are. They, have, they, they will do what's needed. So working to get the trust of self established and having people know themselves and that they will take care of their own survival. To have get their life and being true in life is more important than their lifestyle will change everything. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So that's that's the basis of it. And that part you literally can do with anybody, to whether they've done any of kinds of this work or not, if you slow down and have them see it. Cool. Yeah. So, so somehow we create either through environment or conditioning. We cultivate an interior environment of not uh, first, you could say fear, but it's, it's a not, non-trust of self, non-trust of the sourcefulness and the resourcefulness, because that comes with sourcefulness. The distinction mm-hmm. being sourcefulness is a state of connection to the source of where every resource comes from, ultimately. Because people have not been trained and conditioned to look in that direction, in other words, where we're coming from, which is always source, whether we know yes. it or not. Yeah. And we've lost that connection or that faith, at least consciously. We now, we, you could say hypothetically, we have always an even, the seeking impulse is always equally active. Because again, I see it as the grav- gravitational pull of source on every subatomic particle in creation. And every creature feels this pull. The snail feels it because they want to move from location A to location B. They have no fucking clue why. (laughs) The monkey, you know, feels it in a different way. The tree feels it as growth and blossoming. And and the human being feels it as seeking for this, that, success, power, um, uh, meditation, spiritual experiences, relationships, whatever it is. So we all have this fundamental seeking impulse. You can find it in everything. I I can even see it in a rock. Uh, It's not as obvious, but it's there. So literally every subatomic particle has this gravitational pull from the creator by the creator, you could say source, from source to itself. So nothing can, ever, nothing can ever leave source, obviously. And it's always drawn back in it's somehow through this long evolutionary process of rock and, and whatever. And now we're at the human being stage and we can self-reflect and think for ourselves. But that's also our hindrance because now we are filled with so much terminology, so much language, so many concepts that we've lost touch with just instinctual present moment living. Mm. And because of that disconnect to our source and therefore our resourcefulness as well, um, we start to invest that same amount of seeking energy, that same amount of that gravitational pull. We're starting to invest that now in externalities. Again, relationships, success, um, external security, system, social security, whatever it is. If we do that long enough, we forget, we obscure this nothingness, in a sense, this emptiness, where we can again contact this source and the resourcefulness Mm -hmm. that is inherent in it. So what happens, and that's why courage is required, because we don't know that anymore, right? So we got to, through some kind of modality or knowledge that it is indeed a possibility 
ideally someone that helps us coach and really see it because we can't see it for ourselves. That's where trainers and teachers come in handy. We are pointed to that again. But once we tap into that, we feel it no matter who we are, because it's always there. So what happens is when we shift our focus from where am I going to, to where am I coming from, like Anurag said, all the false wants and desires, they very quickly get cut out at the root. Because why do we want this or this or that? It's because we don't trust ourselves. We don't trust the space without these things. Uh, once we realize where we're coming from, and we can contact that source, and therefore its resourcefulness, which often happens through great loss, like Anurag was saying, where we lose everything, and then all we have left is me. But and then we realize from that me, how vast our resourcefulness is, and how empty or available the canvas is to be recreated at any given moment. And once you have an experiential taste, like you said, it's juicy. So once you have an experiential taste of that, you will never forget it, you might obscure it again, but you will there will the access to it will be greater than it ever was before. Once you built that the courage no longer is required or lessens over time. You continue to come where you, you continue to look for where you're coming from and tune into that. And when you do another beautiful thing that happens with that is, if you shift your focus from where you're going to, as your priority to where you're coming from, as your priority is, there's never an obstacle in between you and you, in between you and your goal. Because if I'm over here, and I want to get over there, mm. there's a distance between here and there. And in this distance, all kinds of obstacles and negative experiences can form. But if I'm over here, and I'm looking for where I'm coming from, that's over here. In between here and here, there cannot be a wall. There's no door you have to go through. There's no window you have to crawl through yet. No people you have to fight. <laughs> so literally, no matter what walls are built around you in your environment, in your relationships, even in your own thinking and emotions, if you really dial into this potential to where you're coming from and make contact to that source, then it doesn't matter what's in front of you, because even your thoughts and emotions are in front of you compared to source, which is me. So everything is in front of me. But if you're coming from where you're coming from, there's no obstacle to where you're coming from, because that's your goal. Your goal is where you're coming from. And there's, there cannot be anything in between me and me ever between source and source between where I'm coming from and where I'm coming from. So life becomes, in that sense, very simple, and therefore beautiful, and therefore it frees up our energy, and our energy bodies to experience much more of that vitality and that, uh, what's it called in France? Uh, uh, elan, elan, oh, elan, yeah. something, this is quite a pretty word, anyway. Like enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. like, elan yeah. is like flair. Your flair. Oh. oh, maybe it's not that one. So, you want a vibra or? Elan, <laughs> yeah, E-L-A-N. I thought it meant like life force, something like that, but no, it doesn't matter. Elan? Like some sort of enthusiasm. Yeah. E-L apostrophe over the A-N. El you know, and while you're looking for, you know, for me, one of the things about that is the, the, if we tie back to being of service and not being self serving self-interest, it's like, you know, people will play sport, like they'll get on the, on the soccer field and they go, oh, they'll play whatever they do, basketball or anything. And they go, ah, oh, that felt great. The recreation part of it is that you get to throw away your self-interest on the field. Like if you were playing, where you're trying to do is to look good and this and that personally, then your game is off. But the part of it is that you get to forget all of that and play for the team, you know, and not have that where you're coming from is for the team, like winning and performing. And then, and that's why that recreation is so enlivening. But you could be all that all the time. You don't have to have that kind of aliveness be limited to the two times a week that you play. It's, it's, not, it's not complex. It doesn't have to be this big mm -hmm. mountaintop that you have to climb. People already live this way in moments. They've already demonstrated that they can. Right. Right. One of the things I've done with a lot of attention is to make sure that everything that I discuss is, is a way of being that people have already demonstrated in their lives and people are living right now someplace in the world. So you can't say it's not possible. Nice. There's no <laughs> question. I'm not talking about some far-reaching thing that is available to only an exclusive flu. Mm -hmm. It is when, you know... I, I an exclusive flu? Flu. <laughs> exclusive Are you flu. talking you know, about the, the chimney where the suit comes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, the top warning where Santa Claus comes down, right? <laughs> it's not only available to Santa Claus is what I'm trying to say. In these, wow. in the, in these exclusive flus. 
I mean, I know he's a happy, <laughs> joyful guy all the time, but that's available to everybody, being as joyful as Santa Claus, which is how we get to the flu conversation. Good example. Regardless. And I don't mean the flu like when you're sick. I'm talking about the flu in the chimney. Just uh, yeah. Elon means... V Elon Vital? Is that the word? V no, it's just Elon. E, e with the apostrophe over the E. L-A-N. Definition, vigorous spirit or enthusiasm. Wow. And I think Elan Vital means like vital energy, something oh, like that. Oh, cool. I stand corrected. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, great. Simplifies life. And then can, people can get in touch with that sourcefulness. And if you look at selfishness, it's really not, like you were saying, it's not innate to nature. It's not innate to the dog. Yeah. Um, hmm. It's not innate to human beings. It's not innate to human consciousness. You can't go out and create peace on earth. You have to drop back into where it's already here. And the cause of self, selfish behavior, selfish energy output, selfish uh, strategizing, selfish interaction, selfish communication, all that, all the, the, the you know, 100,000 layers of self-deceit, the cause of that is not feeling safe. Hmm. It's the cause of the ego. We generate the ego, as I call it in the last episode, it's this little gremlin in the back of our taxi, this hitchhiker that we picked up like so many years ago. And he's been talking into our head for like years now, but this hitchhiker is still in the back of the car. And we've identified with it. So we believe we are that voice. Um, but we invited it in. Why did we invite in this gremlin? Why did we invite an egotism? It is because we felt unsafe. Like I said, maybe we were six years old and our daddy was beating on us. Maybe we were beat up at the schoolyard. Um, somehow we didn't feel safe and we invited in we enabled we allowed we agreed out of free will might have been at a mm. very young age even but at some level out of free will we agreed to the gremlin hitchhiker stepping into our taxi or into our car and ever since we've just been growing closer and closer together like a piece of you know sticker paper before you pull the adhesive apart and it's just it seems so seamless it seems like it's us so whenever this voice is threatened we feel threatened. It's the same. It's become our shield for our insecurity and our sense of not being safe. That's why initially, like we've been saying, it takes courage. But when you find where you're coming from, you this whole world opens up of energy, of mm -hmm. resourcefulness, of nothingness, of comfortability with nothingness, like comfort with nothingness. You become comfortable with just yourself. I love how you put it when you said, when I walked away from that multi-million dollar deal, what I was left with was more me. Totally. It was like, and I felt amazing. Right. Like I didn't sell out. And I'm like, yeah. dude, you know how rarely you feel good about yourself and proud? Like I felt, and then I, I, and I actually even got like, I over that thing about like, I shouldn't feel like we even have this funny <laughs> thing. Like I shouldn't feel like proud mm -hmm. of like, is that, no, I, I didn't feel like arrogant. I just felt proud mm -hmm. of myself. Mm -hmm. Like I got so much more of myself. I wasn't that. I was created by me, not by something outside of you know, me. You increased your honor. Oh, fuck yeah. And that's self-love. You know, and I had, you know, exact, I feel exactly the same. And I tell people like, okay, you made this thing up when you were sick and it maybe it was totally valid that it protected you that time, but right. that's not happening anymore. Exactly. And and one of my, because I always have a, my way of, of looking at things always kind of falls into something a little, whatever, but like, but it was like, I had this boom. Oh my God. <laughs> I have for some years sublet my body to some kind of serious bastard, but he's no fun. So <laughs> I'm going to take my body back. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. Cool. You know? That's what it was like. It was like, okay, I sublet it and he's been living and occupying. He's yep. got a bike. Who's this imposter? Who me? Is it? No, dude, you're out. Eviction. Boom. <laughs> Your lease is done. <laughs> I'm taking my body back. Thank you. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So I, I asked you guys a question a minute ago about what is the most important thing to put your energy yeah. on for people to dedicate their energy to? I think it's as we address. So it's the purification of what we desire because, and I think that's the first step to any true kind of state of self-realization or at homeness with oneself, as you could put it, and honor and self-courage. They're all just syn synonymous, really. Um, you're not going to do that unless you're willing to look at your desires and purify them. Very simple. Mm -hmm. I have a hundred desires. Why do I desire these things? And you'll see which ones come from the root of mistrusting your own space, your own resourcefulness, your own source, how much you're coming from this gremlin voice that began to protect you with your invitation. And that's now continuously repeating 
different versions of the same story of when you were six years old. It's just protecting you in case that happens again, mm -hmm. right? So we're on repeat. We've mistrusted our own connection and we've given it away to this imposter me that's living in our own bodies, pretending to be us and we're believing it with every voice, every, every word in your, that's why clearing out words is also a very profound practice, seeing the meaninglessness of terminology. And it also shows why we often piss people off is because once you come from a state of authenticity, which is much more free with, with terms, it's much more aware yeah. of the malleability and the inherent meaninglessness of words, how optional they are, in other words, that you can play with the words. And some words will evoke certain responses from the gremlin in each of these bodies. Mm -hmm. The gremlin is what they don't want, but the gremlin, in truth, the gremlin is what people don't want to live with anymore. But what, because they're so pasted to it, mm -hmm. um, they believe everything at once is what they want. So purification of desire and prioritization, I think is a key sort of corner, what's the word, cornerstone? Yep. Corner, yeah. Mm -hmm. That pivotal cornerstone moment in someone's life is when they realize like, I don't actually want what I'm chasing. I don't, and that's why it's a very direct path to go from where I'm going to, to where I'm actually coming from. It's a very practical way to undermine a gremlin connection and to sort of begin to mm -hmm. uh, pull the sticker paper apart, you know, and rediscover your true self. And this can be done gradually. Like we don't typically, or sometimes a little bit, if people come to our events, but typically I wouldn't encourage someone to always just quantum leap from, you know, 100% untrue self to 0% true self. Because honestly, people aren't ready typically. And it's just, so gradual is fine. Like as long as you do the work, gradual is fine. But what you'll find is that the more you do the work, the more trust you gain in source, and then the easier it becomes mm. to do the work and the more addictive mm -hmm. to do this purification work. Because now you really start to shift your understanding of what happiness is cool. from where you're getting to, to mm -hmm. where you're coming from. And again, it doesn't matter what situation you're in, you're only in a predicament because you're trying to get to somewhere. If you're trying to come from where you're coming from and purify that and get to know that, there's no obstacle. There's, There's no predicament. No predicament There's no predicament. Because you just are where you are. Yeah. So is the gremlin the thing that's trying to get somewhere? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm So what are false desires? They're predicated upon I'm not safe. I want this to be safe. I want this to have more time and be safe. Or in different versions, different varieties of I want to be sufficient. I want to be enough. I want to be loved. I want to be safe. I want to... Mm -hmm. It's all a variation of I want to be safe. Why do we want to feel loved? <sighs> I'm safe when I'm loved. I'm not safe when I'm not loved. So it's another way of saying mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And then is it possible to offend the driver? Is it, is it possible that like, no, can the driver no, be offended not. by words? No. Like it's if, so someone, a driver, <laughs> a person with a gremlin in the back comes to a workshop of ours, it's never the person that gets, uh, wow. gets mad. Yeah. No. You, why would you ever get upset? That's the craziest question. If you're, like, but if you're, if you're whole, you know, there's no, or whatever, if you're like grounded, you know, sometimes I'll just tell people, listen, first of all, let me just say, iterate, like exact, if you ask me that question, I'd say if exactly the same answer, slightly different words, but it's like in every moment you choose with honor. People go, well, what is honor? You always know. The very few times you don't know, if you really cared, you'd say, hey, I'm going to talk to my friend, help get clear about this. And then, um, uh, and then it's not about zero to hundred exactly. All I tell people is just every week, every month, see if you can increase the percentage at your own gradient even if it takes a year to move up, but listen, at whatever, just like if you were getting fit, I would say, let's find the workout program for you right where you are and then move it up. So mm -hmm. it's about... Yeah, which is different than the temporal thing he described. Yes. Like it's, we're talking now about gradual uh, and I started that, but it's important to see the difference between gradually getting familiar again with your source and its re inherent resourcefulness and gaining trust in that mm -hmm. so that you can easily let go. Like mm -hmm. a monkey doesn't let go of branch number A unless they have a firm hold on branch number mm -hmm. B, right? Unless they're super confident monkeys, then maybe. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they're enlightened monkeys, then yeah. it's like, hey, they start flying. But so we have just, we have this almost inescapable need to hold on to the next branch, whatever it is, before we let go of the other thing. Now, if that branch can more and more be replaced by one's in, inner, interior sourcefulness, then the latching onto or trying to need or want or desire or crave or chase or get somewhere exterior, because then we believe the gremlin says that will procure us 
a greater percentage of safety will disappear. So when we say that typically happens gradually, and we in general encourage it gradually, it doesn't mean we don't hammer on that point of taking them from 0% trust in themselves to 5% trust in themselves. At, in that trajectory, we might deliver the message as if it's all in, but we know it's not going to be all in. Mm -hmm. Like so, But to get to that starting point, an all in attitude is good, but I'm just saying people got to appreciate that this trust needs to be built over time and it will. And this is a self-loving gift. Like, okay, I'm just, I'm afraid to make the quantum leap. If you're really afraid to make the quantum leap, don't think of it as a quantum leap because what's that? It's just another word and it sets you up with greater feelings of unsafety. Mm -hmm. So then look at it as a gradual thing, which doesn't mean you continue to postpone and like a little bit here to kind of cover your tracks and feel a little bit better about yourself. No, you do it rigorously but you do it in a way where you can continue to feel ever more secure, safe, confident in your connection to source within yourself, then it's going to be more and more effortless and you're going to be on an accelerated slipstream. Yeah. And I, the way, the, another way that I would say that for people is, listen, it's, it's not about the amount of percentage of ground you take. It's that you're giving a hundred percent to the ground that you're taking. <laughs> exactly. Mm. So, you know, I've had these ups and downs, I had this injury and like that, I want to be back in the shape that I used, but I'm not. But, you know, if I was in the shape that I used to be and I did a workout at 50%, I'd feel like, huh, but I'm in the shape I am now, but if I give it 100% to where I am now, I feel great today. Right. You Even if saying? it's only 20% of yeah, what it used if, to be. If you're at a, if you're two, you, gi you give it a two, you're like 100%, it's great. It's better than when you're at 10 and you give it five. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's about how you play the game right now, not where you're at, nice. which frees you up from the entire temporality of it, even yeah. though there is a progression. Yeah, and a self-judgment. Uh, totally, There's no, that, that's the release from the self-judgment is when you know you played full out at 7% because that's where you are today. Mm. And it's really okay. But, it, and, and it's not, it's like when, if you really play 100% at whatever percentage you're at, you actually will be satisfied at the end of the day. You'll be 100% happy, even that's, if you're not the, at exactly. your peak state. You'll exactly. be 100% happy. You won't notice the difference because you don't know the difference. You yeah. don't know 1,000% happy. You, yeah. know? you only know 100% happy, yeah. even though you're only at 5% of your journey yeah. in that regard of trusting yourself. Yeah. But it's going to feel like day and night compared to unconsciously clinging to yeah. false desires. Yeah. Just to be in this free fall space and to trust it for the first time in your recent memory, you're going to feel 100% elated. Totally. You know when you played full out and when you didn't. If you're just playing recreational ball, you give it 100%, you feel great. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You play competitive, whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is how you play. Yeah. Well, I like what both of you are describing is that it is totally for its own sake. Mm -hmm. It's not a means to an end. It's yeah. not. So again, like I say, you don't play, you don't get on the field to try to get to the end of the game. You love the game. You're even bummed when it's over because you love playing. Right. So to love playing the game, so relax and play at your level and have a good time doing mm -hmm. it and even sweat and even have, and, and the thing I got, you know, I no longer became interested in being happy or this or that, like it was like the jo no longer chasing the experience. So I saw, oh my God, people's lives are organized about chasing this experience and avoiding this experience. And it's like, wow, what a trap. Mm -hmm. The joy I got was when I didn't care about the experience. And people are like, what do you mean? Like, no, well, who cares? If you're in the game of fulfilling your purpose, playing the game. So you get on the field, the joy of the game, right? What I finally got was, is when you're playing the game full out, you don't have and avoid certain experiences. You have a context for all experiences. There you are playing. And you're, somebody scores on you and you're bummed out. Some, you score and you win. You're exhilarated. You're like, oh, you got a cramp, whatever. But <laughs> you have, you're okay all of it because the game is a context for it and at the end you're like yes <laughs> yeah. right it's about playing the whole the game of life full out and then suddenly if you're playing full out you have a context for all the experiences being alive mm -hmm. doesn't matter like what level you're playing you're playing your game of life mm -hmm. so the joy of the game is to go for it and experience all of it not to you know chase things and protect things mm. yeah which needs trust in self. Trust in self. Trust in self is the, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. But, and then it'll be natural. And then your whole perspective of what true joy or happiness or well being is just shifts and yeah. you stop chasing. Yeah. You, you're still seeking, in my terminology, you're still seeking, not seeking like chasing. You're still connected to the seeking impulse, which always looks to evolve and, and ascend and, and integrate and deepen and 
evolved basically. Mm -hmm. That So that's still alive, but you're not chasing anything. You know exactly where that impulse comes from. You know exactly how to connect to it and you trust it 100%. It gives you a ton of freedom in both in the relative world and also just in, in your own interior. Mm -hmm. It's the context. Like if you're playing the game of soccer because you love it, you're playing the game of seeking because you love it, you will be alive in it. If you're just, if you're playing it in order to get, look good and get validation or like in order to seek to get somewhere else, it'll lose all its juice, right? And so it's like you have an opportunity to say, you know, uh, this time I'm going to give it everything because I chose to get on this field. What the hell? Let's see what happens. And you know, the thing, and I ask people, they go, oh, they go, oh, I'm, why, why you're not happy? Oh, because I don't have this or I don't have that. I don't have a relationship or more money. I said, okay, is there any time in the last three months you were like really happy and joyful? Yes. Well, did you have a relationship then or more money? No. Oh, then they can't be related. There's the physics nice. of it, right? It's total nonsense. You're like, you actually were completely joyful without any of those things and that you're chasing, saying that's the reason I'm not joyful. Okay, you know, why are you not interested in why you were joyful in those moments? Who were you being? Where were you coming from? Right. With what you had, like with what you had right now. Yeah, that is the common denominator, huh? The that's, one common that's denominator. That's the, right there. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, but you said something that you can never not be coming from source. Right. It's just a matter of how aware you are. Well, so you're always coming from source because there's no other source right? <laughs> <laughs> for energy, right? But where we invest it into, uh, where is it channeled into? Is it channeled into some kind of fictitious voice made up of a bunch of words that humans taught you? Right. You existed before humans taught you language. You were before language was imposed, right? Mm -hmm. You perfectly, like a baby is, and you could argue before the baby state you are, that's more metaphysical. But in my, well, anyway, in my world, you always exist. There's no way if you exist, you cannot unexist because that existence, that consciousness, that life itself is source itself ultimately. So what we invested into, we invested into a birth and then we grow up and we get all this language. Then we invested into language and we built this entirely mental conceptual paradigm backed up with biased energy of believing in the words as if they mean anything. And then we get upset by the smallest little thing. And now you're trapped in this mental container, this mental prison of images, colors, shapes, sizes, forms, definitions, self-imposed limitations. That's sores animating all that. But it's so invested in the movie that it's projecting that it no longer sees its own light. Mm -hmm. and, it, and if you don't see its light, you no longer have the ability consciously to point the light in a different direction or play a different movie or even just rest in the light itself or in the nothingness of source itself and build that relationship, like get to know that light that animates everything. So we're always coming from source, but we're not aware that we are. And therefore we, we, we drip feed, we leak all this energy out into externalities. Why? Because we believe we're unsafe. So really the, one of the biggest core transformations that will permanently change a human being's behavior towards itself and its life is when it gets in contact with its own source, and to the degree where it becomes juicy, because if it's just a mental thing, it's not going to transform. It's got to drop into a real place of realization, experiential deep place. Once it does that, once you drill and you reach that well of water, you know, once you dig deep enough, not just like a thousand puddles of one scoop, but one or two or three puddles of like a few hundred scoops, like you'll get to the water or just one. And then once you, once you feel that, it transforms your whole paradigm of illusion of not being safe. And then you're free. Then you're free to create, not create, doesn't matter, but you're free and that energy frees up. And that's what's called health, well-being, happiness, mm -hmm. whatever you will. We're all, that's always available, but we're just leaking it out into illusions and concepts and words. And I think that's one of the most critical, critical points. So mostly people are unconscious to being source. And then some people you get some level of awareness and they go, oh yeah, okay, I'm the source of things and I, well, I need to be, but oh yeah, I failed because I let money or relationship be the source of my existence and you know, like that. And I'm struggling to get back to being the source of my own life, but I go, oh no, 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 no. The power is to go, you never stop being source. Who decided to let money impact you and be the source? 
You did. So you're the source of making money source. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's no never not you. Yeah. But So people but, outsource. Source. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> outsource, exactly. Yeah, I outsource it. So, so, so the thing is, is that people, they've got no access if they actually think that they're not being sourced. They put it on something. Oh, yeah. So they have this kind of semi-awareness and they think, oh, yeah, I'm aware now. I did that, but I can't get it. Why you can't get it back is because you don't get, you never gave it away in the first place. Right. You're the one who chose to put responsibility over there. You mm -hmm. never stopped being source. Yep. And if you get that, you get, you always had full power. That's why this is not about attainment. So much of it is about deconstructing the yeah. illusions of what you currently believe in, mm. which is why people get rubbed the wrong way. And that's why if a teacher plays into their illusions and stays within that safe haven of what words have given good meaning and what words have been given bad meaning, um, then you can stay comfortable, but you'll never have to true transformation. Whereas if you help people deconstruct that, it may be uncomfortable at first because the initial instinctual response that comes up because of the training they've been given themselves is I'm not safe. I don't want to deconstruct this illusion because it's my branch. I'm holding on to it. But if you pursue that, it's not a chasing, but if you investigate that, then that courage will lead you to a well of abundance that's unspeakable and money can't buy it. But it's about deconstructing our illusions more than it is about getting anywhere new. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever not source. People will say, oh, thank you for like the difference you made in my life. I got, didn't do it. Don't put source on me. Right. Nice. Like, oh, no. I said, I, as you know, <laughs> I've led things where people walk out. <laughs> right? <laughs> you have to get. If you were there, you were the source of validating anything that I said and applying it and having it make a difference. I just said some shit. And I've got lots of people who don't do, you know, not only don't produce nothing, but even get pissed at whatever. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You are the source of how you interact with anything me yeah. or Ventinho say. You're always source. If he was the source of someone's well-being, that would have to mean that 100% of the participants would get that well-being. Right. Yes. Because he gave it. Because I gave it to everybody. Right. And it would, boom, then the same thing would happen with everybody. I'm not source of that. You're the source of whatever you do with whatever I say. You never, you are never not source. So, okay, so you got to that. You both got to that again. <laughs> 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 Kelly laughed. <laughs> <laughs> One million dollars. <laughs> so what are the questions though that you guys would ask or that you'd recommend somebody ask? Because you both got there again in totally different ways, like to discover that you are, so, I think you went a really meditative way, like you really investigated what is I. The meditation was just a small portion of it. I'd say self-inquiry, call it investigation, call it meditation, call it, they're all different shades of the same diamond, different sh sides, different facets. It's about the rigorous desire to get really true with yourself, to get to the bottom of things, to get to understand yourself, your life, and to take things into your own hands, for lack of a better word. If people have that desire, then there's no obstacle. And there's different methodologies, doesn't even cool. matter. You can have a lesser stick or a better stick. You know, you can have a dummy sword or a real sword. If you're practicing the same move, you're gonna, you're gonna practice the same movement. You're gonna develop the same skills. So I'm also saying that even the desire to purify one's desires is actually innate. Mm -hmm. The reason people don't do it is you could mm -hmm. say again, safety, but so then that the, even the prerequisite to the prerequisite step for true transformation or true knowledge of self would be, and I often guide people in this way, and I've seen Anurag do the same, is like make them question how good their life really is in the way that they're currently doing it. Kind of undermine that. People have to be ready for that, you know, but if they come to a seminar or something, then we assume that that's what they want. So we have permission to give that. So then we'll say things along the lines of, just to make them aware of how shitty, how, how what they're currently, how they're currently channeling their energy, how it really pales in comparison to what they know is true for them. Mm -hmm. But still, that, still they keep chasing it, these small things as if they're the big things. Right. If you can show them that the big things in their minds are really small and meaningless things that in fact only give them more suffering, like you said, more workload, more time away from source or family or whatever, then suddenly one develops a relationship to one's own sickness that is sick of the sickness. Again, to quote Lao Tzu, 
you can't heal until you're sick of your sickness. We all want to heal, but it's again, funneled in things because we believe that it's not a sickness. We believe that it's not selling our souls. We're selling our souls every day to all these externalities. Yeah. So then we have to point them, first of all, to the fact that they're doing that, because as long as they keep mm. glorifying that, which makes them unhappy, they're not going to take the medicine. So that's kind of a sober story. It can be made fun sometimes. So, you know, we do it in a funny way mm -hmm. and the crowd mm -hmm. laughs and it's, <laughs> it can be very positive energy, but the basic message is quite sober. It's like, you're not happy yeah. and your current way is, and the things that you think you want are actually very meaningless. So if they're in the right environment and they're in the right state of mind, that's brilliant. And they can, if they get that, then they enter this brilliant stream of inwardness and realization. So the prerequisite to the prerequisite of purifying desires is to realize that what you currently want is actually causing you pain. Not, not, it's not the promise of your happiness. Mm -hmm. one, one of the things that I, um, and one small thing to that is like, and then I would just through disclaimers or through kind of the way of instructing it, I would just make sure people don't fall into sort of a pitfall of meaninglessness or despondency, mm -hmm. right? So, cause you're taking away the things that they've been investing all their energy into yep. their hope. It's the carrot dangling in front of their eyes. If you now reveal to them in their own eyes that the, the carrot is already rotten, rotting, and it's, there's nothing really desirable about what they thought they desired. One is left with this gap that can be very new to someone. So it's important that that doesn't then take on another conditioning of, oh, meaningless, means it's meaningless. Mm. Isn't one of the That's right. hallmarks of, yep. of a... Of lemma, yeah, it's, it, it, you get that it's empty meaningless, but it also doesn't mean anything that it doesn't mean. Oh, right. cool. Right? Like it's one of the things, it's like, oh, it's just, there is no inherent meaning and that doesn't mean anything. It's just, there isn't any, right? And, uh, you know, one of the things that I learned, <laughs> like, you know, where I learned where I had a lack of like full compassion and connection is like, I you would tell people, let's do this and really elevate your joy and ha happiness and people would get offended and upset. And I didn't understand why, but then I finally slowed down and got present. And it's like, because they heard an insult that you're not happy. Was, they hold it as an invalidation of everything <laughs> hmm. they've done and all their efforts. And I didn't mean that. And I'm going to say this kind of harshly, but it's like, and I also wouldn't get out of bed for what they called happy, you know, <laughs> you know, but I didn't mean it that way, but I just like, that's not it. But I wanted to like, wanted them to get what's possible, but they heard it as hmm. an insult, right? As an invalidation of all their efforts. And, um, and uh, so the whole, you know, the thing was just to slow it down and have them, um, you know, consider what's possible. One of the, it's actually one of the interesting, one of the things that really hit home for me, like where I, where I really got it distinguished was about 15 years ago, no more than that, a little bit, but working with this company where we worked our asses off to create an incredible, like an incredible work environment. And then we did this, like, uh, we did this big workshop for all of the senior managers and we asked people, okay, we're going to work on this for four days. If you could get anything out of being here, what would you like to get out of being here? It's like your proud moment for me around creation of an environment, right? And the first four or five people all stood up and said, you know what? My life is so joyful and amazing and inspiring at work. I would like my personal life to be as good. <laughs> and it was like, cause, and then I realized, one of the things I realized was, is that um, when the normal thing is people are relieved and go home from work and they feel better. Oh yeah, I'm happy now. They're not, they're less pain. Do you get what I'm saying? So what we put conscious attention mm. on aliveness, joy in that environment, right? Mm. And they don't have that kind of conscious attention on effort when they go home. So it wasn't as good when they went home. But, but people's regular existence, what they call happy, is less painful. Do you yeah. get what I mean? Yeah. So they're happy when they get home, but, or what they think they are. And I, I realize I'm being, you know, assumptive in my, like, this is me giving my view, but it's like, that's the thing I was dealing with that I didn't know how to get across. It's like, oh, it's like, yeah, but, but if you, you could be like this, <laughs> right? But what people go, no, no, I'm happy because when they, when they get home, it's like a relief from work. It's less pain. That's not joy. That's a relief from unhappiness. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And that's when that's because of the way the world is constructed. That's like a step up. That's a highlight. That's like. There. So people, I want to get home from work. I want to get on the weekend. I want to get on that versus, mm -hmm. you know, people would go, oh, uh, why? I say, why are you working so hard and planning your vacation, your wedding and whatever? And they go, I want it to be amazing. I said, oh, well, what does that say about what you think about <laughs> the other 50 weeks of the year? <laughs> you know, how do you want that to be? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and, and it, just like that.
so that also that shows the sickness of our ways, right? And right. I don't mean that yes. in a super negative way. Well, I kind of do, but it's just a, the the error in our thinking, in right. our assumption. And if you can highlight that, nice. people can begin to wake up to that. It will naturally leave because we only invest source energy into the things we believe will benefit us 100% of the time without fail, no exception. That's why somehow the message to get across is look at what you're investing source in, why you believe it's going to benefit you. Does it really? And it's a deconstruction process. No, actually, no, it's not. It's not true happiness. It's this or that, or it's relief from work or whatever. And then, then the journey begins. And but it is quite a journey, you know, it's, um, it requires, it's why we got to conjure up our relationship to source, develop trust in it and excitement for it. And that Elan Vital, if that's even a word, um, that, that, zest for life, that yeah. vital energy. If we don't have that polarization, that building up of charge, again, without polarity, there's no electricity, there's no charge, there's no output, there's no change, there's no work, there is no manifestation, there is no realization. We need, we need the, he calls it effort. It's the same principle that we need that polarity. We need that charge. We need that. Mm. So somehow we have to develop that. And, but we won't develop that if we continue to invest our energy in things that we believe give us benefit, but they actually don't. So it's a deconstruction process and uh, it requires sort of a relentlessness, which can be done if someone is able to conjure up this elan vital or this joy for the effort itself, the joy for coming from where you're coming from right now, every moment, as much as you can. And it's like a muscle you develop. And at some point it's your source of happiness. And then even like, I love what you were hinting at and you've said this before, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of paraphrasing you from outside of the session, which is at some point you even no longer care if you're happy on a mood level, right? Like if your mood is happy or not happy, uh, if your own body is happy or not happy, because often what we equate with happiness is good feelings in the body or serotonin or whatever. Um, but at some point, your sourcefulness develops such a direct relationship to itself that it's no longer even giving power away to the state of the body or the mood of the mind. So, and again, you got to be careful that you don't fall into sort of a meaningless state like, oh, okay, I don't care what happens. It, the consciousness mm. has to be revived over and over again, that, mm, that conscious consciousness, that conscious will, life itself, aware of itself, needs to be conjured up, needs to be revived. But if you can do that while you're letting go into the space of, I don't even chase happiness anymore, then you're getting truly close to real happiness, like what happiness actually essentially truly is, which is source at home. Yeah. This is for me, one of the most important points and to put as a caveat, you know, like, there was plenty of, there was a right in the middle of that animal workout. Neither my mind or my body was happy. You crushed it though. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you get what I'm saying, right? Like, ah, right. But I wouldn't yeah, change yeah. it for a second. Right. Mm -hmm. We're in there, we're doing it and we're like giving her, right? We're but you're not like, oh, I'm so happy right now. <laughs> my body's so happy right now. Like, no, it wants to stop. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of things here. So the thing is, I just, you know, uh, um, in my early disciplines that I was training, you look at this and you look at breakdowns, upset, and quote the negative things, right? And I went moved to a pursuit of what are the best moments of people's lives and what's the mechanics of those. And so one of the things I saw is like, there you are in the workout, you're on the field, in the game, the joy of life, the game of life, the game of whatever it is. And when you're really playing, you don't give a damn. You don't go, oh, am I happy right now? Not happy when I'm chasing the ball. You don't, you don't, what do people think? You don't care. And then as an after effect, you go, wow, that was amazing. But not because you were chasing happiness or joy, because you were in the game. Yeah. So what I got is if I can have people get aligned, their purpose or calling, their game in life and play it full out, they literally don't care. When you're in the game, you don't care. When you're in the middle of a workout, you don't care. You're just giving it everything. And then afterwards you go, yes! You know, like it's a yes to life, to this, to that. And, um, and then... And then I want to translate that to this particular work, one of the biggest pitfalls that I've seen, right? I, I left a lot of the traditional ways of delivering these in the workshops and things like that because something, you know, it was just going off. And then I just really got the thing, which is, this is after my times in the jungle, right? And what, and then being trained by, by the mamos and the ways of nature and go, okay, in nature, if you were to plant a seed or have a child, 
I think the most powerful thing is to be fully present and give it exactly what it needs right now come from the right place and then watch where it grows to right watch how much fruit is born so um what happens is you start to do some of this work and it starts to bear some fruit you know you're this you get a relationship you're more attractive you make some more money and then what happens that fruit is over here and then but what you need to feed is the root the tree the trunk right and then it drops fruit over there but people some fruit starts happening and people start chasing the fruit right you mm. stop nurturing this exactly yeah. i'm telling you Stay true and let cool. the fruit come, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Never, ever leave doing the work. Become, chase the fruit. Become unswayed, undistracted. Yeah. And and it will come, and what should come is perfect for you. And it'll be abundant. It'll be mm -hmm. what you need and just right for you. And it'll be different than what other people. Don't compare right. to anybody else's fruit. Mm -hmm. And stuff like that. So you always, with integrity, stay true. Keep nurturing the root of the plant. And it will, it will bear fruit and you'll get fascinated. Don't be fascinated by it. Just keep being there and enjoy nice. it. You play the game and after the game, you go, that was amazing. But in the game, you didn't go, I'm not happy right now. I want to be happier. That's why people go to a hundred seminars instead of two or three. Yeah. It's because it only takes two or three seminars to get it, right? To, to get the message basically. But so then they do, what do you do in a seminar or workshop or retreat or when, even when you're reading a book or working with a coach, you're... You're shifting, you're, you stop outsourcing for a moment. You start, you get focused, you uh, nourish the roots of the tree. You become self, ironically, self-centered. But mm. because of that, you're able to be selfless. Mm -hmm. But you become focused on source. Uh, you, you dive into something, investigate. So you take all this focus and you drill into this well of a lifeness, sourcefulness. And because of that, fruits are gonna show up. So you think, wow, dude, the seminar worked. Whatever this guy or girl was telling yes. me, the technique, I used a technique and this technique worked. Well, already you're lost, you're gone. Now you're in need of two more seminars because you got fascinated by the fruit. You forgot the core message. And this just requires maturity. And this is why this journey takes so long for most people is because they continue to still be fascinated by the fruit because the gremlin is still in the back of the car, mm -hmm. still telling you, look at the fruit, look at the fruit. This will provide you with safety, with love, with everything you ever missed and lacked as will uh, procure or secure your position, your status, whatever it is, this will give you more than you currently have. So you get these promises because you're focused on the fruit and you need another workshop. You go to the workshop and at some point you're applying it. If you go too much to the workshop with the same guy or girl, uh, you apply it and then it stops working. Like, fuck, okay, now I need a different workshop, different methodology, different language. Oh, now I get it. So you apply the work for that weekend or that week. Your whole energy shifts. Law of attraction kicks in. The universe responds differently. You start bearing fruits because you nourish your roots. And now again, you're fascinated by the fruits. And so it's just a perpetual story. It requires maturity and discrimination to be able to see that the fruits don't cause you happiness. And that's, if you people can get that, if they can get that, if they can detach from their need for happiness in the form of fruits, they need two or three seminars to get it, two or three books to get it. Yeah. So that's why, as a, from the point of view of a trainer or teacher that constantly kind of evolves its own work and investigates and tries to distill it, that's why also the flavor and way of working changes. If you're authentic, I, yeah. I dare say that any teacher that's not authentic that hasn't really developed that authentic relationship, they're using their own seminars as the fruits. They're fascinated by those fruits. Mm. 100%. And so any true teacher or trainer or whatever you want to call these people that do the work, they will always evolve and change. And sometimes you won't see them for five years. And sometimes you'll see them for a whole year every day. And so it, things change and they adapt and they like try new things or they let go of it altogether and they evolve in that sense. That's if, why our way of working changes a lot. You know? oh, that's if the methodology stays the same, the outcome has, the end game has become the methodology and not the intention. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, that covers like all the teachers. You know, I've spent a lot of time looking in the world to see who wants to play. I've got like Ben and Richard and, but you know, like, it's like, I've struggled to find anybody else who wants to, a couple other people I could say, but where um, it's about let's, uh, let's, what's the next development? And they're like, no, we've got this and just, we're going to deliver it. Delivering is develop is different than fulfilling an intention. 
And if you're always in the world of fulfilling the intention, your delivery is always going to change. It'll never be the same twice. That's like saying, oh, if you have an intention mm -hmm. to win on the playing field, your game will always be different. You can't play last week's game. So that's not a... It's just not a new concept. It doesn't matter. The game, you're, they're, you're musicians. You see a, a, a really great artist and they create every concert. You see, sometimes I've been to some dud shows where they just played. You know, you have to right. create. It's new, it's fresh. It's not, you know, it's a... You know, and, but that, then you have to stand present, constituted as the outcome, willing to do whatever it takes to produce the outcome, not which is different than delivering what I have prepared. It's two very different worlds. Yep. Yeah. And I'd also dare say that any sort of being of authenticity and honor that does it for the reasons of wanting to help people, they will, they will inevitably go through some kind of a phase or stage of learning where they acknowledge the fallacy of their own work or the fact that it doesn't yeah. cool this yeah. doesn't reap the fruits that are within the vision of what's possible and so a result of that can often be people either stop teaching for a while or because like again if you continue to repeat you know you're, if, i'm always amazed and this is not doesn't necessarily mean that someone is inauthentic it's not what i'm saying but i'm always amazed how sometimes I see these seminar schedules for three years ahead yeah. and they're booked. They have 50 gigs a year. I'm like, I, I just don't comprehend how that's possible. And, and my question is, or my curiosity is, um, it's not a firm conclusion, but my curiosity is like, why, why are you doing that? Are you really, are you still connected to the people that you're supporting or helping or claiming to want to make a difference in their lives on behalf of their own desire, their own free will, of course, they have to decide it. Or has it just become a thing? Has it become mm -hmm. a hobby? Has it become a career? And I think it's a, I think it's, it's a bit of a contradiction to be in this line of work, which is to help people transform themselves and make it a thing or make it a gig. Like it's just not compatible. If you do music, that's one thing. Or, you know, you make movies, that's another thing. But if you're in this field of helping people understand themselves, just, I would say, just be really careful for when it becomes a gig, because then are you, where are you sourcing it from? How can you know what you want to say three years from now and that you even want to say it? How can you, how can you, I, I just don't, I get, I'll, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, uh, it feels so unreal. It's like, mm. there's now, and there's the connection that you have now with the collective and it's always evolving and it's, there's a rhythm to it and it's got to be authentic every moment. So I've had trouble even, I know that I have to for timelines and people having to book flights, but three months ahead is, <laughs> is about the max. That, mm -hmm. And I know it, you know, it sacrifices a lot of attendance and money and all that, but I just can't say who I am six months from now and where the collective is at and, and what the message is. And it's, it's, it's ever fresh. And I think it should be that way if the intention continues to stay pure and then reinvent itself based on new observation, new evidence, uh, new experience and so forth. Yeah, well, that sounds like nature, like the harmony that you were describing. It is nature. You know, this tree will grow this way. It'll grow, it will adapt to what's happening. You have to adapt to what's, in the environment with the people. If you really are operating, like if what's at stake is you, your company, your delivery, that's one thing. If what's at stake is life, it's another thing. Mm. So if you go to any environment where life is at stake, the game plan never survives contact with the opposition. The mm. surgeon that doesn't you know, survive contact, you have a plan, but you have to open up and go where it goes. If you get on the field, you have a game plan, but it doesn't survive contact with the opposition. The battle doesn't survive contact with the enemy. You have to, whenever, when you're really playing high stakes, you're saying this is life at stake. You, you prepare yourself, but then the preparation is internal and then you respond to what's in front of you. You can't say this is what's going to happen. Yeah. It's just, it's not authentic. Right. You know, and then you, otherwise you go and then, and listen, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I prepared content, you know, some years ago when Rich and I would prepare for do a workshop, how we prepared was we'd start two weeks out. We go, okay, let's debrief the last one. What do we do? What do we do? What really worked? And what we do is we take it away from each other. We take it away. And then we would only get in front of the room when we had no idea what we wow, were going to do. Cool. We would spend two weeks erasing from our shelves all of that we knew to do and what we knew was effective so we could be just a space for an intention to be fulfilled. Nice. And that was our discipline. 
and it what it elevated things to an exceptional level wow you know but it was like it's either an intention to fully be of service and fulfill this intention right. with you that's the or it's point. an intention to live deliver something we know and those are two different things right so is the intention to deliver actually contributing to the disharmony the it is i mean i don't want listen i was there i don't want to it's not a i don't want to like yeah. And it doesn't mean it doesn't serve some it, people. It, it, the thing is, almost almost the pitfall is that it does make some difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, it doesn't yeah. not make a difference. Yeah. Otherwise, people wouldn't keep doing it. Right. Right. It's just not the fulfillment of the... Uh, let me say it like, this is my view of it. This, I'm, listen, I'm only... Every single thing I'm saying, I've done. Right. Yeah. So this is not pointing a finger at anybody. Yeah. I did it, and I, and I was dissatisfied in what could get produced, but it was like... The moment it becomes about the delivery and the methodology, it no longer honors from which the intention, which the methodology was born. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and that's, it's mm -hmm. just, that's it. And it doesn't mean that the methodology doesn't make some difference, but it's not honoring, in my view, in my mm -hmm. view, mm -hmm. from whence the intention that that, 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 that that methodology was born. It was born to fulfill an intention. Right. And if you're all, in anywhere you look in the world, when you're always coming from intention, there's an evolution of the architecture, there's an evolution yeah. of the mm -hmm. process, because you're so committed to the intention right. that, of course, every time you you deliver, you learn. Right. Every time you work with it, you you can't not grow. Like you like a, a, like in surgery, they deliver and then they go. Oh, we every time they learn, then they publish and they go. Like it, there's an you know, when people are sourceful, they they're hungry for what's the what can else can we do? Now we're you wouldn't keep making airplanes or do surgery the way we did a hundred years ago. It would be insane, right? You would think that's crazy. Yeah. So then why would we do that in this work? Yep. And probably a lot of, like we're talking about, you know, self-help speakers and trainers and teachers and stuff. I think f for a lot of them, it's also sort of an innocent trap because I've seen a lot of speakers that um, become trapped in the game that they started, but then they feel trapped in their own system. Yes. Um, and somehow maybe they just they just don't have the realization or the willpower to kind of investigate that or deconstruct it, or maybe they have some insecurities themselves and it seems like the safest thing to do, so they continue it. Um, but it's because when you start, like when you have a message, right? People get typically, most of the speakers that I've met, they started with a really sincere intention. Yeah. They realized something that made a big difference in oh. their lives. This inspired them, Source inspired it because Source naturally is generous and sees everything as itself. So it just wants to give what it knows of itself effortlessly and freely. So then this inspiration feels so good and so true. And, and it inevitably in our world falls in some kind of a structure, architecture modality, uh, be it speaking events, uh, renting venues, scheduling things ahead of time, charging money. Yeah. Those are parts of the ways of this world currently. So then you've, you, you choose that because that seems the means to deliver the message, the most direct means to deliver the message or one of the most direct means. So you start doing that. And initially there's this, and I echo what Anurag was saying, I'm sharing all this because this has been my experience. It's not finger point. It's educating possibly. And so then you start that, but if you're not careful, you become a, you become a slave of your own product, of your own creation, right? Yeah. What you created, it now creates you. God. And yeah. by the way, that's, all of existence, if you look at everything, this systems, bureaucracy, that kind of, right. we created it, and now it's creating us. Yeah. We have to do that this to make it. becomes about the survival of the structure. Be wow. survive, we now are surviving the structure that we created. In Again, order the to gremlin survive. of unsafety, just yeah. in the background of a company, in the background of, <laughs> doesn't matter, entrepreneur, uh, spiritual teacher, doesn't matter. You gotta watch for this gremlin, because like, it's always fresh. You're always coming, where are you coming from? So how can you know what you're going to do three years from now? You can't, like, unless you have placed a system in place and is somehow providing you or people with something. And now it's become about the sustaining of the system, which is only the means to deliver the message, which is fresh and sources, not a thing, right? It's not, it's not a thing. It cannot uh. ever be reduced to a thing or a structure. So it's so important if you're someone who wants to share from the inspiration that's connected to source, whatever your message may be, it doesn't have to be spiritual. People can be connected to source and deliver a message that's not apparently spiritual. But as long as you come from that inspiration, just be so careful when that inspiration, again, the, the nourishment of the root of the tree, when it turns into the fruits, 
Don't be fascinated by the fruits or you'll lose your authenticity. And before you know it, you feel less happy than you were before you ever started teaching or sharing. Mm. So you gotta stay fresh with that. And it, in you know, just you know, to give people um another dimension, it's like it's like everywhere. It's, it's the same model. Like, you know, I work a lot with business and entrepreneurs. And everybody's been on the a customer of a business at the beginning. It was amazing. They were on fire because they were just fulfilling this intention. And they created an entire architecture and a structure in order to fulfill that intention. And as soon as it hit this critical mass, it became about the survival of that structure and not fulfilling of that intention for people. And people go, oh, it doesn't feel the same anymore being a customer of them. Yeah. You know? And that's as a customer. And then at the at the at the founder level, you know, I work with this guy who built this $80 million company, you know, uh, and he did it from a very heartfelt place in food. He helped small uh, family farms still be able to, the, be, who are being destroyed, like, you know, by big f farms into mm -hmm. being able to, finding a channel to supply grocery stores. And he like, he did so much passion at the beginning, but he did it with insight. Well, I talk about people working in their mediums, in their own mediums, which is, and then, and then so his mediums are like, finding solutions, teaching people, all these different things. Once he got over about 10, 20 million, he stopped working in his medium. He started working in like having to do this and CFO meetings and this and stuff like that. And then he couldn't figure out why he was so successful. He bought a McLaren, he, you know, like all, the, like all these different things. And he just was miserable yeah. because he was no longer working in his passion. Right. And it's a, it's a big, and it, but he was even more like upset because how, why should I, how can I, be unhappy. Like, right. Look what I have. Yeah. Can't justify it. You know, and it, it messes with you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And here's this. So you, you're a child and people don't realize that this all typically comes from childhood stuff, right? So you're a child, you feel unsafe at the age of six, let's say often even sooner. You develop this second voice within yourself, this gremlin, this imposter self. Its main purpose is to s secure you, to make sure that you're safe and well secured and positioned and all that. It starts to not really affect you at some point. You do some transformational work and you kind of get beyond it. You have some sense of freedom, some sourcefulness, some space opens up within you, a true connection to yourself. And inevitably that it source is an inspiring place. It ever evolves outwardly and it, its creation ever evolves from source. So any entity that connects with source is inspired almost instantly. It's both a strength and a pitfall. You got to watch for it because what then happens is you let's say you build a company or something you're an entrepreneur you, you get inspired you have this brilliant idea it's going to change people's lives and you start it like the farmer thing you, now you build a company okay now you're starting to make millions of dollars uh people start to respect you for it people start to look up to you mm. for it yeah. you so you get all these things that the gremlin that was kind of suppressed for a while because you didn't, it wasn't around you. You weren't respected as much. You didn't have the money. So you were more humble in a sense, somewhat falsely humble because the gremlin was still there, but mm -hmm. the upper, the fruits weren't as big, but now you start this process, the fruits grow really big. And so everything that the gremlin tells you in the back of the car, whispers you to your ear that you need to be safe, that you want for whatever reason, whatever justification it gives to that, it's always some form of safety and being loved and being enough and all that. Now you have this whole thing, which depends on the structure, the finances to respect it depends on the structure. Now you depend on the structure, as long as you keep believing that that's now your safety. So it's about constant going back to source. That's why the realization that happiness doesn't come from anywhere is very crucial, that nothing contains any happiness, because only then can you cut this illusion at its root and stay perpetually s regenerated from a sourceful right. place. But if you suddenly as an adult then get all the respect and the status and the money, you get these huge, enormous fruits and they fulfill all your false desires. So are you going to go back to source? Probably not for a while. Some people never, yeah. right? They just perpetuate that game, more fruits, more fruits, because now you have the means to perpetuate ever bigger fruits. And so that it becomes this rat, this uh, rat race. Because you're never, you, you hit this next level of fruit. You think that, and then you'll, then you'll be happy and peaceful and you're not. So then you go, oh, I must need more fruit. Mm. Right. And you keep driving it forward and forward. You know, there's some, um, and you can see there's some videos online, like uh, Lady Gaga, I'm trying to remember his name, the actor who played Ted Mosby on uh, How I Met Your Mother, stuff like that. They'll talk about how depressed they got the more 
famous, they got the more successful yeah, yeah, they got. Classic story. Like they're saying this, and I, I show it like this, and we became number one. And I was like, and literally, I mean, those things will lay it right out for you. You don't have to take our word for it. You can go listen to people who talk about that right. when that's what they were chasing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So how do you recommend watering the tree, going to the roots? I, I, I mean, this will be, re for me, repetitive. I think you know, we've said that, you know, it's like really where you're coming from. It goes back to honoring where you're choosing from right now, right? So it's, you know, right now, choose with honor, right? Do what's aligned, you know, mm -hmm. it's... it's uh, And perceive, perceive the greater benefit in that as opposed to the fruits. Because again, we will only go, that's true, but we will only go in that direction. We'll only want that because sometimes we're selling something to people, but they just, they're not ready to want it because they yeah. really believe in the fruits. So they have to somehow realize, because you, you always invest source energy, you always outsource it to what you, 100%, what you believe benefits you the most always, yeah. always. So what we're doing is we're transforming through dialogue and investigation, we're having people realize that what he's saying, to live in each moment from where you're coming from with honor, with aliveness, with consciousness, with presence, with deliberateness, that accumulates spiritual mass and there's nothing in the world that benefits you more. Mm -hmm. If you realize that, you will do it and you will want it. If you don't realize that that's where the benefit lies, doesn't matter how many seminars you go to, well, you will never do it. It doesn't matter. You will dabble in it. Yeah. And if you're lucky, the dabbling will open this well and it will transform you somehow. But it doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen. You got to learn maturity, discrimination, really take a good hard look at your sickness. Even right now, people are listening to this to try and get a path to fruit. Totally. Yep. <laughs> well, exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. So like right now, for everybody that's listening, stop it. <laughs> In the words totally. of Bob Newhart. <laughs> well, I was right? thinking there's so, but, many, but, there's so many like nuanced <laughs> ways people will be listening to this thinking. That's right. Like, have both. Like yeah. I can have both. Uh -huh. like nice. That's a really common one. That's yeah. a nice character. Uh, what, what that's a nice gremlin voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. can do the spiritual seeking and make a yeah. ton of money. Yeah, and, sure. Yeah. There's um, one of the funniest things when I used to do my business workshops regularly. I started. You started it by. Um, I got in this habit of opening with this question, right? And the same thing happened every single time. I would ask people, "Okay, you're all here. Let me ask you this: What's going to make you happier in life? Getting more or not wanting more?" And they'll be like, and everybody kind of knows already what the right answer is. And the first person <laughs> that puts up their hand always asked, can I have both? <laughs> really? <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> because the, the self <laughs> knows it's about not wanting more, but the gremlin is, yeah. I want more. No, no, I, I, I program with like more, you know, like that. But it has never failed. Never failed though. If when I ask that question, the first person always asks. What's your answer? I don't answer. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's... It, to answer, I, do, I just don't. I said, you know what? You already know. I mean, it's just, there's nothing to answer. Sort it out. And then use the next couple of days to sort it out. But you already know. And well, then deal with your attachments. But it's, so that means just even for everybody that's listening is, is to say like, there's, um, the invitation is, is to really stop and go, where am I listening from? Am I, am I willing to hear this? Mm. Because what we're saying is, you know, whatever got you, remember you said what happened when people come to you, then what do you do? I said, tell them, wherever you're coming from, let's throw that out. Whatever you came to me for, let's throw it out. Everybody that's listening, whatever you came to listen for, invitation is throw it out. Possible way, right? Is it good now? And then see if you're willing to let go of everything you wanted to learn and therefore achieve from listening to this. And see if you're willing to go back and go, okay, I'm going to let go... One one of the things, Corey, that that I that um, that I've been really working on with people is to give up. First, note become aware of, and then give up their addiction to the picture mm -hmm. of how they want things to look. Right, you know what I'm saying? Like the picture, it's like. Um, so, in one of my iterations, one of the milestones I hit was like, okay. I see people are, are creating visions from poor, from lack beliefs, right? So we'll get them to a source of place. They create a, a beautiful vision and it would like literally would make you cry. You were so moved by it. So I thought that was good. But then what I watched was there's where they were coming from when they created it. 
But then slowly over time, they started coming from the pitcher versus where it came from because the pitcher has to move and change with life. But they became attached to it and they would start to compromise their integrity out of their attachment to the pitcher. Totally. You did? So people are listening to things like this and thinking it'll help them achieve their pitcher. And what we're saying is get rid of the pitcher. Nice. And just do the work and see where it takes you. So are you willing to do that? That's that's my invitation to, to everybody, right? I got it. I totally get it. I get where the picture came from. I had lots of my own. A lot of how I got here was I met and exceeded my picture a whole bunch of times. Like, and I ended up having his, <laughs> on paper, this incredible life, and it still wasn't it. And I go, okay, got it. Not that. So whatever got you into this dialogue, whatever you're th trying to achieve from it, my invitation is to let that go. Just be here and just to do the work and see where that takes you. Beautiful. And people are mostly, my view, is listening for it from a place of, let me hear, let me l learn something so that I don't have to do the work and get to my picture. Right. Versus I do the work and take, let it take me wherever it does. You get that? Yeah. I want to learn something so I can not have to work too much and get to the picture versus I'm letting go of the picture. I'm going to do the work and see where it takes me. That's, that's the simplest way I could put it. Yeah. And then that comes full circle back to what you said in the very beginning, which is to see that it is a choice. Yes. Yeah. I love that. That's which then clear. goes back to as where Bettina said, it starts with trust of self. So you've trust of self is to say, wherever it takes me, you know, I can trust myself to, to have that, you know, to, I'll be with that, do whatever, you know, you'll be okay. Yeah. Not because out there, but because you can trust yourself and wherever you go. Yeah. And people can have both, but not through those means, not by that question, not by that state of consciousness. Right, as a byproduct. In fact, every the best things that we've ever created or the fruits, the best fruits that have ever come to our body, mind experience, they've all come from this connection. You know, yeah, if you, if you want your kingdom, if, the, if you think that's what's gonna make you happy, you gotta let go of the fact that you think that's gonna make you happy. Will the kingdom come? It might. Your kingdom might come, your empire might come, but that will come only from your connection to source. It will not come from this lack state because the universe responds to your frequency. And if you're needing, and it's just not a state where you can perceive, receive the frequency and the manifestation of the things you think you want. So you're also shooting yourself in the foot. Even if you believe you can get happiness through the fruits, you're shooting yourself in the foot because you're never going to have the fruits that you want. You got to go to source for both worlds. And you'll learn over time that as you then leave source, because the world starts to shape up the way you thought it would make you happy, you learn a tough lesson and suffering kicks your ass, which is good. It's yeah. love. That's why there is so much psychological suffering is because there's guidance and we're being guided. The sooner you pay attention and the happier you actually be, the less need there is for suffering. My life has so exceeded any pictures I ever had. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, and the, the, all I did was let go of everything and just be a service. And it's like in the latest iteration, like uh, three and a half years ago, I gave away everything I owned. Everything I own is here with me upstairs in two bags and a motorcycle at my friend's place in Los Angeles. So I said, I'm just going to be of service to the earth. And um, I gave away this, all my money. And then I, and I earned just enough to get by. I have like nothing. I have zero net worth. <laughs> and in the last three years, Beautiful. I've had the most ridiculous existence, right? I've like been so many places, you know, there was down in <laughs> St. Kitts, there I was, you know, where with you guys in the desert and a camel trip or mm -hmm. with uh, Williams free diving in the Bahamas. And I could just make a list of here at India or Colombia, like, and it's been, I don't know, magical is even insufficient, right? but I've been all of these places. And so all I'm doing every single day, you know, we were talking about Jeff Bezos earlier and how many billions, mm -hmm. like, dude, his life, I wouldn't, it's nothing. Who gives a damn? Like, I mean, he's working in his office all the time. I'm around the world doing the craziest shit ever, right? How many billionaires are like, they're still doing, like we were talking, we were talking with Dennis, like they're a maybe a few weeks or months a year or whatever, what I'm doing all the time, needing no resources other than staying true to source. Right? All I've had is the craziest, most remarkable, magical adventures. Our time in the villas in Italy, you know, like, I mean, just one thing, yeah. one thing, one thing. That's my entire existence. Yep. 
do you want resources or do you want the source of all resources? There's that's the the whole thing right yeah. there. And the universe responds. So there's and it's it's like that analogy of like you see no footsteps, you know, it's just a black empty space. But the moment you place your foot, a step appears. Boop, boop, you're always carried. Yeah. And it's just a different way of life. And it's <laughs> what that's why the planning seems so ridiculous to us. Um it's it's just not how source operates. It's just it's always fresh. It's always it's a really false state to believe that life should be planned or life should be this or that. Mm. Yeah. It's just not how anything operates. It's only this human fallacy. It's just this idea. It's illusion. And we've become addicted to it. You know, and people can say, you know, if they're listening, oh, well, you've got this or but I've got kids or, you know, it's it's it still applies. I yeah. know that maybe you won't, but you have kids. And so, they, but, you know, say if you look at Anya with her two girls or whatever, I could give you the, but it's still, she's a, such a fluid, you know, a flow. It, it will be appropriate to your situation. There's no right. irresponsibility. Right. But it's still that kind of magic. Right. It's, it's not about going, oh, I'm, and people can, because I've had people say, oh, yeah, but you're this, you don't have a responsibility. No, actually. And they do. I take care of my son, my mom, all the different things. Yeah. Right. But things show up. You can, I can't, you can't, you can't plan for those. Like, like the very best pictures I had would not have planned the things that were amazing for me in the last three years. Yeah. It exceeded anything that and, I could have imagined. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that there's no periods of soberness, right? Or like, yeah, like manifestations grab. that don't fit the bill or th don't fit the image of like a, a beautiful blue lagoon or like spending time with the uh, Kogis in the Sierra Nevada. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the happiness is not dependent on that. Plus there is an understanding that that is actually in your best interest. And so you're yes. using it and to generate even more direct connection to source. Yeah. So the happiness is not uh, altered in that way. And the progress, the evolution is not halted. So it's not, yeah, we get to a lot of beautiful places and we meet a lot of beautiful people and very cool stuff. And it just happens, shows up, bop, bop, yeah. bop, with no need to plan or like have this amount of money available for it ahead of time or it just shows up, just shows up, just shows up. And sometimes, you know, COVID-19 has mm -hmm. generated an environment that to some degree also has changed our external flow, right? For just as one simple example, but that is not in any way an alteration because you've learned to live from source. If you've learned to live from the fruits of your actions, then it's such a shock. It's such an yeah. alteration. People get so depressed. Yeah. yeah. That's really, really critical. You see, if you were living from the fruits, the fruits were just taken away. But if you're living from where you're coming from, this doesn't change where you're coming from. Like every winter for most trees. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it doesn't change where you're coming from. It's just how it is. It's so you're you're never out of balance, right? And uh and you know, and you look at those things when I gave those examples, but but we didn't go, Oh, if I get to go there, then I'll be happy. It right. wasn't that. It was like, Oh, that's what's happening. Right. Okay. Well, you know, what there wasn't there was no I need that. It it arose. Yeah, nice. Right. And that's just really critical to get. None of those things wasn't in order to. It was a natural expression of what was arising, including, oh, I spent the last few mom, months at my mom's house, you know, because of COVID and this and that. And still, like, you know, that where I was coming from caused that to be great. You know, yeah. it was what it was. I created what things, new things for myself and all of that, because where I'm coming from isn't altered because I'm not traveling and I'm there for three months. Yeah, you both say in different ways something about how after you make this commitment, everything just gets simpler. So mm. simple. Yeah. Because you're not threatened by anything. Nothing can take away where you're coming from. And this isn't like a creation from us. If you, if you really study and research, you'll find um, stories about guys who were in prison. And when they got this, they got free inside of the walls. It didn't right. matter. They were free because yep. they, they, were, they went back to source. The walls have nothing to do with it. <laughs> You've like fantasized about the... Yeah, sometimes, you know, if I created too many projects for myself and got a little <laughs> distracted or like for the sake of service or whatever... And it's like, wouldn't it be great to be, uh, you know. Yeah, and just be able to have to. Just, just because of the simplicity yeah. of it, right? Yeah. yeah. Sit in one room and not have to do anything yeah. and just be, have one, that time totally. I mean, one of the greatest material gifts or like man, gifts in the manifestation, one of the greatest fruits to someone who really cherishes their connection to source is simplicity. Hmm. Yeah. Doesn't mean it can't be on a beautiful island or on a yacht or 
a, a cool party with like influential people. You can't have all these things. But to where one's life and architecture and flow is set up to where it's so simple that the connection to source is always easily available, mm. even in your sort of off days or something, because you get, it's so easy to get, you know, to get drowned by your own creations. And yeah, it's just, it's not the source of happiness. So why would you want too much things or stuff? Now, if you really have a solid connection to source, it doesn't matter. You could do that too. And I have done that too, without sacrificing my connection to source, different faces, different periods. So it doesn't matter. It always changes. The canvas changes, but there's always, there's always beauty in it, even if it looks sober. Mm -hmm. That's why if you give up the attachment to the picture of how it should be, then you're always rich and rich and learning and like deepening and evolving. It doesn't matter. And then you start to cherish simplicity. Doesn't mean poverty, by the way, per se. It just means simplicity, right? Simplicity can have many shapes and sizes, but some, some, an arch, you want to get to an architecture, an okayness, which your 99% of your desires are false desires and you're just generating all this jitter in the air, all this like crisscross talk and vibrations. So you're getting this life of chaos and there's no cohesion to our manifestation for a lot of people. But when you get really aligned, you just start beaming out this frequency that's your true self. So you get a life that is most, that's the best means to express that unique connection to source. And sometimes that looks very simple and sober and basic. Sometimes it looks very wealthy and, and free and, and exuberant, but it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. You know? Yes. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah. You don't experience any difference. Yeah. None. People think there's a difference, but there isn't. Right. Mm. And when you're in that free flow, it can come to you. If you're like so set on wanting it, it can't come to you because you're in the vibration of lack and you keep it away. But yeah, it's got to be it's got to be equal ultimately. Every situation ultimately, if you really realize the power of source and that that's really where the happy you know buzzword happiness is found, is felt is experienced, then yeah, it doesn't matter. And, and if there is that equality, then anything can come and go. That's in your best interest and in the best interest of what you're here to share. So most of the things that have been created for me in front of my eyes. For a lot of people like outsiders, I think sometimes people think, oh, that's me creating that for myself. Mm -hmm. Or like, oh, look, he's in this beautiful villa somewhere and there's a beach and I want that because that would secure my security. And he's creating this, uh, whatever, using money or law of attraction or, and so, and so he's privileged. And people don't understand that these manifestations, they don't matter. And, and they are these steps that just appear in empty space and they are steps that for me anyway, and I can say for Anurag too, they're actually not for us. Does it mean we get no nourishment on a relative level, a body mind level? Is it not, are we not having any fun? Of course we're having fun, <laughs> but fun also doesn't matter. It's not, doesn't change anything. So really what these things are for that are created in front of us are, are the platforms, the means, the catalyst, the, what's that word? relay, if you will, they're relays, they, like, they, they're like they accelerators, they just allow your expression to come through. Mm -hmm. They allow us to be of service in the ways mm -hmm. that naturally come from the source connection. It has very little to do with us at the end of the day. It's not that I had this picture on my fantasy wall and now it's there and now I'm happy. It's got nothing to do with that. It's just a natural manifestation that comes from source, creating whatever needs to be created to be a jumping platform for more people to hear this message. It's that simple. Or for some other, maybe some Sometimes people aren't hearing anything, but other kinds of work gets done for the planet. Like you were saying, it's not just people we work with, it's animals, it's energies, it is uh, the earth itself and so on, consciousness itself. So they're just, they just show up and have nothing to do really. When you're really connected to source, your life becomes like a mirror of the collective. It has very little to do with you. And the fruits of your actions have very little to do with you. You could even say nothing. Yeah. I mean, at the, at the core of it, it would be nothing. It's like where all the places we end up is because it empowers our ability to serve the intention. Mm. Right. And it looks different ways. And it's not any different than, let's say you were an Olympic athlete on a, on a, on a team, you would eat the best food to be in the best condition. You know, you would do things that nurture you so that you can play. It's not complex. And it, but it is, it is important to nurture that self. 
you know, and you start to make sourceful decisions about, you know, I, I remember like uh, a year and a half, a couple years ago, it was like, you know, I changed like a lot of things and I say no to a lot of things that look very tasty, <laughs> but are like Oreos, right? <laughs> so a friend of mine, friend, family friend of mine called me up and said, hey, I'm, I've been, uh, I got this contract. Now I go on this really expensive cruise line, this luxury cruise. And because they're really diversifying in their entertainment and stuff like that. He says over, over uh, f six weeks, I do five lectures on quality of life and stuff like that. And I'm allowed to bring one other person. Would you like to come? And, you know, so I could go do this cruise for like five or six weeks and, you know, do just a little bit of work and this, you know, like have a really good time and stuff like that. And it was something I could do with my time. But it, and in the, if some years previous, I would have said, yeah, let's do it. And it would do this, make a little difference and this like that. But it wasn't the more sort, most sourceful thing. And actually it was like, oh, I could do that or I could, you know, spend time with, with Bentinho. And, and it was like, it was like a no brainer, mm. but it was what, what, Aww. what nurtures the most. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love uh -huh. you too. That's uh -huh. right. <laughs> Because they could have got on those ships and gotten laid and all sorts of things. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hey, don't rule things out here. Just yeah. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, but you know, I remember that time, like some whatever that was, and it was like, okay, there's yes, there was, and the thing is, you'll see a lot of great things come towards you, and you choose aligned, right? And there's and there's just what what nurtures and and. Um, and uh, it's it's not it's not personal, it's just not right. personal, mm -hmm. right? And you're you're choosing from yes, this is what nurtures, this is what helps, yeah. You know, and sometimes listen, <laughs> you know, we there's the there's people will note on those pictures of you know of the villa and the beach, but you know there's also the time of us being in mud huts, right, with nothing <laughs> except a lot of mosquito bites and you know being deep in the jungle oh, man, and a yeah. really important connection to the <laughs> earth and fun. you know it was. <laughs> You know, you couldn't get where further. I dis where I discovered, by the way, that the only thing that works against extreme mosquito bites is lime juice, in case it helped. Yeah. Huh. Remember, we were rubbing yeah, like, right, tons right, of lime. <sighs> but I mean, you know, and, and, but, you know, it's, it's interesting how much people don't notice that, like that, like it was as opposite, like people would say, oh, I really want that. But they wouldn't, they would go, I don't want that. Right. right. But it's, that also was part of the work. There was an effort mm -hmm. to that. There was. Doing a five-hour hike in the pitch black, straight up a mountain in mud that came to our knees. Remember that through Panther territory. Through Panther territory, and we're jaguar, sitting and stopping jaguar. at a point. He goes, "Okay, everybody, stay close here because there's uh, jaguars here, and we don't want you to get eaten." <laughs> like literally, right? And then, but like, but you got to go. Like, and I'm, this is not an exaggeration. We went in pitch black, you know, straight up for five hours, right, in really deep mud and all sorts of things, and. Nobody's going, hey, that was awesome. I wish we could be there <laughs> in the mud, <laughs> right? It's whatever is yeah. mm -hmm. when it is. And it, and it was super cool, you know? So that's the thing. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just because everything is, is <laughs> just expression of source and serves a purpose, so. Yeah. Well, they're thinking, I'll just see, you know, also this one thing uh, that, so sometimes people say, oh, they would like to say, really want to distinguish the learning from the application of the learning, like the work. There's work, right? So people say, oh, they want to live, let's just, even if they look at the pictures or whatever, they want to live like us or be like that. That doesn't come from doing a course. That comes from doing the work every day. Yeah. So everybody nice. that's like, just, okay, fine. We work at this every day. <laughs> that's fine. It's available to you. It's available to everybody, but not from listening to something we said. It's from applying it and working at it every day. Right. So how we get where we are is to work at it every day. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested in this, then fine. And my thing is work at it every day. Mm -hmm. And not expect some insight from this dialogue to make the difference. That's only to give you, ah, oh, that's what I should be doing every day. Mm -hmm. Yep. So homework. Awesome. Yeah, homework. What about... Any homework from both of you? I like the homework that your friend told you once. It's not like write down what you've learned, write down the, the actions you would take. Yeah. Based on what you yeah. learned. Mike Harris, mm -hmm. he was brilliant. He was like, he would never write lots of notes. He would get whatever insight and he would write, he would have pages of only, here's the actions I would take as a function of that insight and not the insights. Cool, nice. Right? And he's just such one of the happiest and most effective human beings I've ever seen. 
because you just because otherwise you're just getting notebook notebooks full of insights. Who cares? Yeah. And he would just write down the actions that were consistent with those, and then he would go take those actions. So whatever, yeah, absolutely, whatever. If you got, because usually when you're listening, it pops. Right. Exactly what you said, Ben. Yeah, and that was that's what. Yeah, it's definitely what I'd recommend too. Nice, beautiful homework. So yeah, just like three or four things that you would do as a function of these insights that you've learned here and just apply it because okay, so then you'll take it from the notebook to your life. It's the only way it matters. Cool. Thanks so much for being here, Anurag. Thanks for having me. It was great. It's fun. Um, I know you don't have the typical setup uh, like website and oh, I think you do have some kind of website. No, but, I don't. Oh, you don't? Okay, no, cool. No website. Not active anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and social media and stuff. So let's say there is somebody. So two things. One is how could people contact you? And we can also set that up for you if you want a different email address. And what would be sort of the requirement of anything that would even sort of enter your sphere of interest? Like, hmm, That's actually a good question. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so first of all, I, I, I do have a, a Facebook profile. People could look up Anurag Gupta and it's Anurag and brackets rags Gupta just to distinguish. And you'll know it's me because there's just, I just post jokes every day. Right. Nice. Right. <laughs> uh, you can send a message there or whatever. Um, and I have an email, Anurag at the difference engine.ca. You know, the, the thing is, um, I'm, I mean, really, actually, I've, I've removed kind of the idea of conventional qualifiers because, you know, I really am in the world of not knowing. I'm open. The thing, the thing is really this, is what it's for is... is um, I'm open to anything as long as really people are are clear about I want to do the work. You know, one of the things in the, when I do, if I do do a workshop in, instead of uh, I don't know how to say like well we I, I sc really screen people and it's like listen I want you to be clear that to work with me is to not go oh I'm going to do this have insights and everything will be easy to work with me is to go oh shit I'm going to have more work to do <laughs> mm -hmm. you know like and I'm committed that it's like uh, I love the. The, the game of like we talked about like for what I call effort like I'm gonna put sweat and effort into this just like if you're playing the game and and um but it's gonna be effort that I love so you're gonna ramp up you're gonna raise the bar you're gonna so this is not about getting an insight it's about going I um you know, lit up by the prospect of sweating and putting effort into what's possible I think that would be the only real qualifier cool yeah and anything along the lines of um let's say someone's really feels the resonance based on what they've seen of you and heard of you. Yeah. Um, and they've got some kind of project because I know you work a lot with, you know, like the Kogi tribe in the Sierra, yeah. um, uh, like regenerative earth practices yeah. and building methods and like architecture and stuff like yeah. that. So I, I could imagine someone who has a project or um, valuable resources or connections that is in that field that would be on fire based on what you shared and feels yeah. a connection. They could reach out based on those kinds of projects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the different things I'm working on. If if it were to fit, it was a life regenerative business model, a new kind of business model that is about that 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 um, that regenerates life on the planet. It elevates and creates alignment with human beings. It elevates the health of the earth. Um, the ultimate living space plan, uh, project and about redefining what it is to design and build a living space. You know, um, the I think I think the. Um, the thing, one of my one of my things is they could either say yeah we I would love to find out what you're doing and participate in that or if they have projects the qualifier is this is that I will only work on things that the development of that thing creates a new precedent for humanity it doesn't just serve the project that the development of that project creates something new that serves the earth all awesome. of the earth and humanity that's the defining factor so the very the very process of creating the project needs to be sourceful. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And so, it needs to display the same regenerative qualities that it aims to establish. 100%. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and I've seen you work this way with people, so it's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. well, thanks so much, Rex. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah thanks for being man. It was fun. Good Very to have fun. you. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Mirror Talks podcast with Bentinho Massaro. If you love these teachings and you want full access to almost all of Bentinho's recorded material, go to bentinomasaro.tv. 
Right now, we're offering a free seven-day trial with unlimited access to everything on BentinoMassaro.tv, including curated playlists, guided meditations, and much more. This is our number one recommendation for you. As a subscriber, you'll get first access to these podcast episodes two weeks before they go public. You'll also get access to exclusive Q&As with Bentinho and other content only available to subscribers of BentinoMassaro.tv. Also, Bentinho recently created a free online global enlightenment retreat. It's eight long-form sessions that coherently guide you through the foundation of his enlightenment teachings. You can watch the free online global enlightenment retreat at BentinoMassaro.tv or on YouTube. If you're interested in the most current and complete overview of Bentinho's work to date, this is where we recommend you start. Another great resource is Trinfinity Academy, Bentinho's free online school for enlightenment, empowerment, and infinity. Each class is concise and clear and distills one key topic at a time, including homework. We strongly recommend you check out Trinfinity Academy if you want to master the mechanics of Bentinho's teachings. Finally, don't underestimate the value of sharing this episode with the people who came to mind as you were watching or listening. It's a service to them and the collective, and it's also the best thing you can do to support us in getting this message far and wide. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and leave positive reviews and ratings on your preferred platforms, and follow Bentinho on social media, especially Instagram. Thank you 